Hi, John McElroy here talking all things automotive. I'm back with Terry Wachowski, the president of CareSoft. And you can see they've arranged a whole bunch of things for us to look at today. And Terry, my understanding is you want to show us some of the amazing evolution that Tesla products have gone through and also compare them to some of the legacy things that yeah. are out there. Yeah. Well, John, welcome back to CareSoft. Thank I'm you. Glad Thank you, you could come. Um, we're in our studio at CareSoft here today. Uh, last time we were out on the on the floor where we had the hoist and all the disassemblies occurring, but uh, we we created a studio for our, our work our benchmarking uh, during COVID because when the uh, social distancing mandates came in, engineers could no longer come and look at all the ideas that we had for them to make the designs more efficient, uh, which which we did before COVID, and and we'd done for decades before. Um, but you know, all of a sudden nobody could travel, work from home, social distancing, and it's like, well, we're not going to just lay down. And so what we did is we learned how to broadcast. And so we created a studio, uh, got the right kind of lighting, the right kind of acoustics. And then when we would go through our design reviews, now we would do it online. And I had doubts when we started doing that because I'm an experiential learner. I've got to touch <laughs> things to really understand them well. But um, so I was a little bit hesitant, but it was the best we, we had, and we started doing it. And the fact of the matter is it turned out really good. Because before, when the groups would come and you'd be looking at the part in, in, you know, they, uh, you're specifically talking about, you'd have the principals standing around it and you'd have some of the managers and you'd have engineers. And by the time you were three or four people away, you were just doing email. I mean, you can't hear, you can't see. But doing it this way, everybody gets a front row seat. Everybody can see the parts. We're doing it live streaming. So if anybody has questions, we can turn the parts, we can compare them, we can show the you know, competition of who's doing what. And so it's worked out real well. Uh, it's also very global. We can have customers anywhere in the world and presenters from anywhere in the world. And if you're just watching, you have no idea. You know, I got some, one of the subject matter experts is in Florida. One of them is talking from their kitchen table in, in you know, Dearborn and one of is over in England and we're talking and the customer's in China. <laughs> yeah. You'd never know. Right. So, uh, you know, we really, um, this has been very, very helpful. And in fact, post COVID, we, we continue to communicate in this medium, uh, showing the ideas, how to improve the designs. And then of course we open the door to the engineers to come, here's the parts and go ahead and wrestle with the parts and, and learn everything you want to. But um, we, we have it to set aside here. Uh, for you and Sean today to kind of look at some of the things well, that we've seen look before. At I'm, I'm chomping at the bit here. The last time, uh, one of the last times we got together, we looked at the steer by wire. When we had the cyber truck the, up on the cyber rack. Cyber truck right. was up in the, in the air and we showed uh, in situ, you know, where these parts are located and what it looked like. We've got them out of the vehicle now, so I thought you'd give you a little uh, better look. But, but this one is not no, a it cyber is not. truck. No, this is uh, uh, near and dear to me, it is a Chevy uh, Silverado. But, uh, Near and dear to you because you ran the truck. Yeah, I did, yeah. and uh, I, I lived these for quite a while. Um, but this is a, t a typical very steering typical. system. Yeah, you, very you got the steering wheel, you got right. the column, you got the, the yeah. rack. Yeah, steering wheel. Uh, this is a, a we, people call it a tilt column. It's really not. It's a raking column. A tilting column had a, a ball. Mm -hmm. This rake, the whole column, uh, goes up and down for adjustment. But as you, as you steer, it turns an intermediate shaft that is in turn goes through the front of dash and then goes into the rack and turns the rack. And then there's a motor that's associated with that and gets a command to give you the assist, the power steering. Mm -hmm. So you give it the command, it says, I'm going to turn. It calls for the motor and says, here, let's, let's turn this thing. Mm -hmm. So that's how we steer and this is the, the yeah. system uh, that we know and love today. But, but this is not what you found on the cyber truck. No, we sure didn't. And uh, you know, this is one of the technologies that they, uh, introduced, which was uh, steer by wire. And there's been talk about doing this for a long time. You know, the aircraft industry, of course, uh, you know, this is a great uh, a problem that they solved with fly by wire. Uh, now, in an aircraft, you know, you have a pilot and co pilot up at these, these control yokes, and the control surfaces are a long way away. In, in the know, tail of the plane. In the tail of the plane or out on the tips of the wings. And so instead of hydraulically connecting all these things with actuators. And when you flew by wire, it's like, yeah, just run a wiring harness back there and run a little motor. So it made all the world uh, of sense to do that. 
but to apply it in an automotive uh, feature was uh, this is unique. Yeah. And so to do it in a in a volume production, here you can see the the business end, uh, at least for the customer. You know, the steering wheel. We talked about it, its shape and the. Uh, I guess we could talk pros and cons of that. I could. I would accent the cons yeah, but yeah. personally, but <laughs> that's a, it also is a, a power rake. So there are little motors that adjust the steering wheel up and thing. down to so your comfort. You like it in and yeah. out, and up and down, telescope and, and up and down. But as you turn the wheel, it is turning a shaft that is uh, located inside this housing. And then what it's doing is actually engaging. If you look right here, as you turn the steering wheel, this will start to turn and it gets sensed here by a sensor, by a torque sensor. So it knows how far did you turn the steering wheel. And how, how fast quickly, you're turning it. How yeah, fast right. and, and, and how far. So now armed with that signal, we take that information and we send it down there. Before we go down there though, uh, we also bring a signal back and send it to this motor. And then this motor is attached and there's a belt so that when the, the wheels react, either because you gave the sense and then they're being pushed back by the road or, or uh, impacted by the road, we take that signal and then generate that load here and send it that back to the So that motor wheel. is giving you effort in the steering wheel exactly and any right. kind of kickback. Exactly. To it. Otherwise, it would be like flying a joystick in a, a game. Yeah. Right. It would just be a freewheeling no, steering wheel. There'd be, be no, no feedback. Absolutely zero feedback. Yeah, which you would hate. Yeah, I, I would. So, so there, there's got to be some very clever calibration in the algorithms that provide that kind of feedback. Yeah. Ab absolutely. And what you can do with that information, how you can change it. You can mm -hmm. change it as a function of vehicle speed. You can mm -hmm. change it as a function of steering wheel angles. All, all the, the types of calibration work you can do can really start to tune this thing mm -hmm. in for you. Mm -hmm. Once uh, the operator has put in a command, that signal is then uh, sent uh, to this motor. So now all these parts that we're looking at right now would actually be down underneath the, the front end of the chassis. Right, they're in this rack. Here's the steering rack, right. Right, Everything. there's the case. Uh, you can see the actual rack that, that slides That's back and nice forth. That's a, it's <laughs> a nice bar. It's a beautiful bar. Very nice cutting machine. You know, very beautiful, they are. And what happens is through these series of, of gears, there's a motor that will turn. So as you get a signal up there, it says, I want to turn. This motor says, okay, how far, how fast? It turns, turns it mechanically, and then moves that rack back and forth. It moves those tie rods. They, in turn, move the, uh, the wheels, and, and we steer. You'll notice an exact duplicate motor, same part number, in fact, but it sits over here and essentially, and you hope, just goes for the ride. It's really not doing anything. It's just there in case this one craps it's, out. It's there as a failure mode uh, uh, deterrent. It's a countermeasure in case this actually were to fail. Mm -hmm. System will flip over here, mm -hmm. and then you'll be able to steer here. Now, question, Terry. I look at all these parts on this table, the parts on that table, and I compare it to that Chevy Silverado, and this is way more complicated. Uh, it's got to be way more costly, too. What's the advantage of having, I, I, how do you justify doing this then? Yeah. It's not from a cost perspective, that's for sure. As you said, I mean, just visually look, you're competing with that, with this. And we've got all these motors that are, that are associated, the controllers, the sensors, the harnesses and everything. The, there's a couple real advantages. One is the types of things you can now do with that information. I can change that steering feel because you can say I want a different steering feel or the conditions at which I'm driving, how fast I'm going, uh, what kind of road surface I'm on, uh, how much angle I'm turning in. You know, I can change my, my C factor. I do, typically it steers like this, but all of a sudden I want to steer like this, so it's much more, more fast. So how you can uh, tailor this to um, you know, the driver's desire on how this vehicle feels. So for a sporty type performance vehicle, gives you greater bandwidth than what you can do. Mm -hmm. um, from a, uh, an ADAS perspective, when you want to get to you know, level four ADAS, 
all of a sudden you can do a lot more with this system than you, than you can with you, this. You could do emergency steering. Absolutely. Oh, accident avoidance. Even if the driver doesn't do it, the, the car The driver can disappear mm -hmm. and, it, and it can still do it. In fact, it, it would ignore you, right? Yeah. Today with this system, you get steer by wire. If you intercede, the system knows, oh, your boss, okay, I want to go here. You think we should go over there. It's up to you. I'm done. Bing. Uh, in this case, it, you know, it would have the opportunity to say, I don't, you know, you're detached. We're now going to safely get you to this. Mm -hmm. I look at it a little bit, you know, this, this came from the aircraft industry. But to fly an airplane, every time you make a control change, either pitch or yaw or roll, there's no such thing as doing just one dimensional change. Because one dimension affects them all. And so as a pilot, you go, if I'm doing this, I'm also doing this, and I'm also doing this in order to keep this airplane doing what I want it to do. So you are trimming, you are doing all these things. Modern aircraft, uh, you know, fighter aircraft and stuff, much of that is automated. So that the pilot, instead of having to constantly be dithering and changing trim and doing this and doing this, you know, they're concentrating on a mission, they're concentrating on, on a target or evasion or whatever they, was they need to concentrate on, uh, but, you know, have to interfere, in, uh, intervene much, much less because the vehicle. The, uh, the early pilots, man, they were busy people. Yeah. <laughs> they flew those planes. They flew them. <laughs> yeah. and and we, we talk about the seat of the pants. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. They're feeling and, all that. And here, too, you've got the rear steer, too. And, and i got to imagine, as long as you're going to have rear steer for all wheel, wheel steer, mm -hmm. then maybe all this drive-by-wire or steer-by-wire at least starts to make even more sense. Right, because now you're using those signals back here in a similar fashion. Right. Uh, and they have to work... They're, they're not identical, what they need to do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're the opposite yeah. of what they need to do. But uh, the fact that they need to do something in a coordinated, integrated way. And so this is the, uh, the hardware that's necessary. It's interesting, there's three shafts that actually connect. Uh, this, this shaft is driven by uh, some gears here that uh, will run that back and forth. Uh, there's a kind of a clever way that they use to, to spin that. Um, and then we just move the shaft back and forth. Uh, that shaft is attached to these clevis brackets. They go to these tie rod ends, which in turn go out to the wheels. Sure is a lot of parts, though. A lot of parts. Amazing. Even a belt. A belt from the motor. Yep. Very interesting. To, to start to spin. Yep. Very interesting. Okay, now also let's talk. a lot of motors. Talk batteries. Away from uh, steering and on to batteries here. And you've got an interesting display of 12 volt. 16 volt, 48 volt. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the sign's pretty obvious here. This is what you would find in a Ford Bronco, right? Right. This is what you find in almost all vehicles in, in the globe, a 12 volt system. Yeah. And uh, typically they were driven with a, a lead acid battery. And these are heavy. We've known about these batteries. We've used these batteries for decades and decades and decades. There have been you know, technological uh, improvements with the type of grid that we use and how we make them, you know, as, as reliable and as long lasting and as deep charging as we can. But at the end of the day, it's lead. It's very heavy. This one's 23.3 kilograms. And I so think about 50 pounds. One of the, uh, the big technological evolutions in this 12 volt battery was the incorporation of some tools. <laughs> <laughs> because these things, they have a, a, only a limited shelf life. It is not uncommon to have to replace them, especially in cold weather. And they're so heavy, they're just miserable to get out of there. You know, you start actually molding in handles and giving them away with the battery. It's kind of giving away tooling uh, right up to the point where you have to change one yourself. And you're really grateful for those who do that. Also, if you think of the structure that's required to mount this, you know, the bracketry and the fact that it has to mount to something very substantial. And then we have to connect this to that. And so the clamping and all this stuff, it's, uh, there's a lot of cost, there's a lot of mass. Mass begets mass. And this is a mm -hmm. perfect example mm -hmm. of that. Now when Tesla introduced the Model Y in 2021, they have a low voltage system, just like the, the high voltage system. And they have a 12 volt. But you can see this was actually was quite a light. No kidding, it's half the weight yeah, of... Uh, yeah. Now, it doesn't have near the, the cranking hours, 
of this, but right. it doesn't turn a starter, <laughs> and it's not flipping an engine. It right. doesn't have that kind of duty cycle. It just has to run all the auxiliary That's stuff. That's exactly. And again, uh, you know, nice handy little handle to get it in and out. But uh, so this even was, Tesla thought this was too heavy. You know, that's right. Well, and it is heavy. I mean, try to lift it. It's it's it's, it's, yeah. it's significant. So that's got uh, twenty five pounds. Yeah, that's your easy. workout, sure. But that was kind of a, an evolution as as Tesla came to market, and quite amazing. Within a year, that was replaced with this. So that twelve volt lead acid battery was replaced with a 16 volt lithium ion. This is unreal, it is so light, one point, oh uh, my gosh. 1.8 kilograms. That is beautiful. So mass begets mass, but in an EV, it's, ex it's exceptionally uh, important because you have to carry your mass with you. So it, it's gonna, it, it takes range. And in order to get range, it takes batteries. Well, batteries are heavy and they're very expensive. And, uh, so mass is, is one of your biggest enemies, and so the idea you know, to come get the mass out everywhere you can, and here was a perfect example of uh, you know 10 kilogram, uh, 11 kilogram reduction uh, right off the bat. Now comes the Cybertruck, and again another technological uh, leap here, but going to the 48 volt architecture. When we get the whole vehicle. Uh, you know, disassembled, and we've totally done all our studies on the 48 volt. I'd like to have you come back, and we'll really explain that, do a deep dive into the 48 volt right. uh, system, how it works, and such things. But there's the battery. Yeah, no, no, that's really so cool. So there's a. Uh, so it's a little bit heavier than the lithium 12 volt, but it's 48 volts. <laughs> it's like four of those, you know. So uh, it's it's, and I think it's like 41 volts, 42 volts, or something, but. That, that is quite the, uh, quite the accomplishment. Quite the, the weight savings. And so you can just look at the evolution that's happened in a matter of years, a couple of years. Right. To, we could Where go, the legacies we could, are still back on the big listen, heavy lumber Listen, we could go put a, a 1940s battery and it wouldn't yeah. be much different than that, that <laughs> right. one over there. So quite a, quite a progression. And this uh, in particular, when you look at the net efficiency of such a system with respect to everything, your harnesses, how many wires, how big wires, how many strands in these wires, how much do they weigh, how much do they cost? This is a, a huge enabler from an efficiency <laughs> perspective. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we're busy uh, reversing, trying to understand this whole system. Uh, it's not easy, it's like trying to you know, tell you how your nervous system works and <laughs> not hurt you, but uh, uh, we're, we're, we're quickly doing that. And this is, you know, the, I think the industry is very interested in this. And now, very interesting display of instrument panel support beams. Is that the right terminology? Yeah, we refer to them as a cross car beam. Mm -hmm. They go across the car mm -hmm. uh, from the A pillar right in front of the driver, you know, door to door. There is a piece of structure between those pillars. You don't see it, you don't know about it, you don't essentially care about it, but it is important. And uh, structurally, it's giving uh, strength to the vehicle, it is supporting the instrument panel and everything that's associated with that instrument panel. Uh, it, the steering wheel column is attached to it. And then any crash worthiness countermeasures, airbags and such things are, are incorporated into it. So it does a lot of work. Uh, maybe kind of an unsung hero, but, but it is. But if we look at a traditional, and here we have the Volkswagen ID4 as a representative of, of a traditional approach and a very good approach. I would say Volkswagen gets uh, kudos because they did a, a very nice job. But if you look, John, uh, you know, it's a combination of tubing, they're square tubes. Look at all the welding that occurs everywhere, the transitions that occur, the bracketry that has to come in. Where does it attach to the pillars? Where, do, where does uh, the column and, and such things attach? If you understand all the uh, uh, the tolerancing required in order to have an IP fit nicely and glove boxes work, these things are, all the brackets got to be perfect. It, from this, this is dimensionally. This controls everything, and so the GD and T, the What's the dimension. GD &T? It's the gauging dimension. It's it's how do we control variation? Uh, how do we engineer the thing so that it all works? Mm -hmm because there's nothing perfect, so you have to have slip planes in certain places so everything will come together. Where you, where you come down to the tunnel, you know, and attach to the floor, well, what if the floor is not there by this much, you know? How do you accommodate all that? So it, it, it is uh, quite a challenging piece, and it's heavy. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this is another uh, example. This was actually quite efficient. This is the GMC Hummer, the electric uh, Hummer. And, but you can see because of the off-road nature and the ruggedness of the vehicle, uh, you know, it's, it's larger. Uh, in, still in a lot of here. brackets. But and it's still a lot of brackets. It's still a lot of work. It's still, you know, uh, quite, quite a challenge. This is a, an approach to make a lightweight version. Uh, this is the Ford F-150 Lightning, and this is a cast magnesium beam. So it's cast in one piece. I don't have all this welding. I don't have all these, these problems. Uh, but magnesium castings are, are relatively expensive. It's an expensive so way to save are, weight. So you are you know, paying a premium to, to save the weight. One of the challenges then comes in, I've got to bolt a lot of stuff to this. And so, and so fasteners, brackets, bad, bad. You know, brackets that are, come in that everything has to now attach to. The brackets have to be attached, uh, you know, with the radios and glove boxes and AC ducts and everything. So, you know, by the time you add all these brackets in and all the fastening and everything, of course, that's all cost and mass and labor at the end of the day. So. Uh, you know, a, a valiant attempt to get mass down, but uh, this was the approach they took and you know, pros and cons to that. And no surprise, I'm sure that's not the way Tesla does it. No surprise, <laughs> when Tesla came out with the Model Y, it was a bit jaw-dropping, to be honest with you. And you look at the cross-car beam, and if you compare what was traditional to what they came up with, you know, an ex elegantly simple. You know, it's a hydroformed aluminum tube, poof, and then they co-inject plastic bracketry to it. And it's like, wow, this thing is light, uh, you know, from a cost perspective. I mean, I almost joked this, this almost looks like a, a, sh a sh shower curtain rod. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's been compared to the others. Yeah, so. It's been called called worse, <laughs> um, but they came up with that, and this is this was really uh, a head scratcher. It's like, wow, look at how they've done this, and you know, why didn't we think of this before, or why doesn't work? But when you talk to some of the engineers who have been involved in, in designing and, and building cross car beams for maybe their career, you know, one of the first reactions was, well, it won't work. In fact, that's a quote: it won't work. I said, well, darn, you know, we bought the car, we drove it, it seemed to drive real nice. Um, it gets a five-star crash rating. What do you mean it won't work? Well, it doesn't meet all our requirements because there's a lot of requirements as things from a structural perspective and a crash perspective and all the things it has to do. Well, what requirement does it work? Well, we have, you know, uh, vertical bending resonant frequency specifications, and that doesn't meet it. Oh, but it seems to ride great. It's, everything seems right. Why, you know, so what? Why do you have that requirement? Well, then you realize some of that requirement has come about because of uh, an internal combustion engine in a V6 or uh, inline four configuration. They are dynamically active. And when that crank goes around once, those engines have a couple imbalance in a second order, a couple imbalance on a third order, torque you know from firing and they shake like crazy well we don't want the passenger you know the driver to experience that so we have to come up with all those specifications on how to design the thing such that it's quiet and smooth and good it's an ev it's an ev you don't <laughs> need all that it's got an electric motor it hums like a sewing machine it's just you know you don't have all that forcing function so it's the game changer so th this is something that you've talked about in the past how legacy automakers have to unlearn some things and definitely unlearn some of the legacy specifications that they have. That's that's a, a prime example of that. Mm -hmm. And you know the the natural reaction says it won't work. Why? Because this is our process, and it that won't fit in the process. It's like okay, what about your process? Uh, wouldn't allow it to work when it really does. Because not only did Tesla do it, but so did Rivian. And so did Lucid. I mean, they followed an almost identical. Well, uh, undoubtedly, design they approach. looked at what Tesla did and said, "Hey, good idea." Good idea, <laughs> you know. And the supplier <laughs> says, "Hey, I'm doing it for them. I can do it for you." And mm -hmm. and of course, uh, you know, they didn't have the tradition of the legacy, so they didn't have any of the advantages of a hundred years of, of learning. But they also didn't have any of the baggage of a hundred years of things that you need to unlearn because they are no longer germane yeah. uh, in this world. But then we've got uh, well oh, Tesla oh, themselves as as they evolved, 
from the Model Y, then we would look at the Model S blade. Now, this uh, hydroform tube is now just a, a C section. So it's, it's just half a, a C tube. channel. It's half a tube. And again, uh, injected plastic around it yeah, here. Because this is a full tube. That's right. Yeah. Very so again, a, a very efficient. They just sliced uh, design. it lengthwise they just, they and continued to work. And how do we make it better? How do yeah. we make it lighter? How do we make it uh, less expensive? And uh, a very interesting evolution. Mm -hmm. But even more of an evolution. Well, now we come Cyber to the Cybertruck, <laughs> and and we get to the cross car beam, and it's like okay, well, uh, again we have you know a, a substrate here. Mm -hmm. as you can see the aluminum, but they've really taken the, the plastic to a new a new height. You see mm -hmm. how the injected moldings here and all the, uh, uh, but, but but pick it up. Yeah, that yeah, it almost it looks heavier. Yeah, it looks it's heavier. a little heavier for sure. Uh, and you know, from an efficiency perspective, how much weight does it have to bear, and how much weight is it versus how much things we bolt onto it and such? Um, you know, those are. Uh, this isn't the most efficient design. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, you have to look at the duty cycle. In fact, oh, I'm a truck. Oh, I'm going to be playing off road. Got to be beefy. Oh, I'm going to be banging around. I right. can't be breaking. I can't be rattling. I can't be doing. Uh, these types of things. So, uh, very interesting. Uh, again, the design, but following the same essential principle, but but doing it in in a way that fit their need here for the Cybertruck. And these uh, square holes. Yeah, what's good, that about? Good eye. You know, we talked here about all the things that get attached to it, and the need for brackets. And then we rivet the brackets on, or we bolt them on, screw them on, weld them on. However, we do it. And Tesla, because they have this molding. They just have these little windows, and the parts just snap fit in. They just have tabs. It's just push it in, click, it clicks in, it that clicks is so in. smart. And so from an assembly perspective and labor time, you know, driving that out. Yeah, yeah. And then here's one of the things that attaches to these uh, That's one these of the, the parts. Uh, you know, this is the, the standard glove box. And uh, again, this is from a, a Silverado as an example, but the typical way, you know, it's a latch. There's just some uh, levers and little latches that connect over here, keep it shut. By the way, it has to stay shut. You can't get in a barrier. They can't be flying open and stuff flying out. It doesn't work. So it's not a simple thing, but it is what it is, and, and there it is. The, uh, the Cybertruck, and I've got this one upside down so you could see it, but... To open the Cybertruck, you go to the touch screen, you know, the glove box, and glove box open, and you, you touch it. When you do that, you know, the computer is sending a signal to a small motor. It turns that gear, which turns this gear, which in turn opens the glove box for you. So that's just a cool feature. It's just right? kind of cool. I mean, I mean, I've never seen the the Silverado like is that. way simpler and cheaper. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, this truck wasn't done to be the most efficient design in the world. It's just not. It's a, it is what it is. And that's why it's a hundred thousand dollar vehicle. Yeah, it's, and it's designed, designed to be, to be cool. cool. Right. And why is it worth a hundred thousand dollars? Well, because I can open the glove box with a touch. Okay, well that's wonderful. But uh, I saw I thought the way they did this is uh, uh, that's pretty cool. And any college student working on kinematics and machines, I'll take a look at it because it's, it's a pretty cool application. It's more complicated, but it's elegant. Yeah, that's it. Okay, what do we got You got to get something for $100,000, I suppose. Well, with the, with the vehicle, uh, the EV, you've got to charge the batteries. And how do I get from, from the charger into the battery? So I have to travel through the vehicle. We do it through a charging cable. So these are 800 volt systems. Uh, this happens to be on a Rivian, but it's exemplar of, of a typical EV uh, charging cable. But these are very large cables. They're copper. Of course, they're insulated. So they're heavy. Let me yeah, see. But, but pick that guy up. Oh, I would not want to be working on the assembly line trying to put this on a truck as it goes down the line. No, it's like wrestling an anaconda. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> I love job. that analogy. It, it, it's, it's appropriate. This would really be a difficult assignment. Yeah. And, and quite frankly, electrical harnesses are. They're tough yeah. assignments because they're plug in here and here and they're kind of like spaghetti. Mm -hmm. uh, but Tesla took a very different approach. Imagine that. Imagine that, right. And in the Cybertruck, this is that. 
Wow. Let's see. No. Okay, so different. it's not super lightweight, but wow, is it weighs easier than that. And being solid, I'm not going to have to wrestle with this right. thing to get it to the connector yeah. point. It's, it's a couple things. Number one, it's aluminum instead of copper. So it's cheaper and it's lighter. And the second thing, as you mentioned, it's a hard part. It's like any other hard part you're going to assemble in this vehicle. So in order to manipulate it and put it in, it's just much easier. Um, you could automate it. You know, robot have a robot can actually put this in. That would be much more difficult to, to automate, of course. Now, in order to do that, you've got to be way up front in the process where you're arm wrestling for space, packaging space. Uh, you know, here, if, if you weren't, they just say, well, get it from there to there. And, okay, your, your stuff is bendable, bend it. A snake it around, kind of a, a historic way to do it. This says no, you, you optimize the packaging, work with the body, the long lead uh, release parts, so that the parts come together, boom, and it just goes in. Uh, it was a very similar design that they used in the Model Y. So they had an aluminum uh, part in the Y, and you can see it's... Oh, yeah. 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 Pretty light. But this was a 400-volt system, an 800-volt system, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, yeah, it's got to carry large. We sectioned this, so we cut it down so you could see the inside. This is what it actually is. This is the wire. This is the aluminum rod that's carrying the current. Mm -hmm. You know, you say wire, but you know, to me, it's like, it's like a metal bar. Yes, it is. It's just a bar, and, and we're sending the current through it. It then has a layer of insulation, mm -hmm. and then that insulation is covered with another aluminum tube for protection. And then, of course, with the 400 or 800 volt system, we put this impervious uh, orange uh, shield on it. <laughs> But it's really, it's a, a standard to say, don't cut here. This is, this so is, first this responders is in an accident, do don't, not no, touch the This orange. isn't a good place to cut. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. In fact, if you look inside of one of these, you, know, you can see we're a section there, but this is a, a section right across. You know, the current is all flowing right through this center, this large rod. You can see the insulator, the outside protection, and then the, the sleeves. That's cool to see, because like I said before, when I heard about, you know, aluminum wiring, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking like traditional wiring and yeah. not, not these kinds of bars like R this. Well, yeah, and, and to make it a hard part, you know, the thing has to take a shape and keep the shape. Right. It can't easily be, be deformed and yeah. in, a, in a production environment. So. But that's, uh, I could probably put that part in yeah. <laughs> for a couple, <laughs> couple jobs. Okay, one more, right? Yeah, one more uh, to show you here today. Uh, this is the, the air tank. This one is from uh, the Model S Plaid. Mm -hmm. And so it has an air lift suspension. Mm -hmm. Well, when you have this uh, suspension that lifts and controls the vehicle's attitude by air, you can't just rely on a compressor and say that's what's going to power this thing because it takes too long to, to generate the pressures that you need to do that. And so we store the air. We store it in a cylinder, in a, in a reservoir. And then when we need it, psh, We've got the pressure and we can pretty, uh, pretty quickly move the vehicle. This is, uh, as I said, is off the plate. This is interesting and it, it says something about uh, Tesla's culture in that in the previous model, this was mounted low in the front, like where a frunk would be. It was, it was low, it was another part that was attached. In the latest version, where we took, had one here to, to tear apart for another uh, reason, this had been replaced. It's up top now, and it actually spans the shock towers. Now, most all shock towers have a brace between them, just for structure and for ride and handling and you know, to make the vehicle feel good. All of a sudden, they said, hey, we got this big guy anyway. Why are we just carrying it around down here, and then we have this strut up here? Get rid of that, mount this up there, and let that do both jobs. I love that. I love that approach of every part on the car has got to do more than That's, one thing. Uh, you, you can't just be philosophy. along for the ride. That is the philosophy. It's like you, you must integrate. These parts need, need to be uh, you know, synergistic so that they're bigger than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got to do many things. And what's this other tank? Now, this is from the Cybertruck. <laughs> so it too has an air suspension but you have much greater distances to travel and a lot higher loads because it's a truck. And so you can tell the tank has to be considerably bigger. In fact, it kind of looks like a, a scuba tank, uh, if you would, it, it is so it large. Does. It's mounted back in the, uh, the pickup box area, right? Mm -hmm. kind of right below where the tonneau comes mm -hmm. in and rolls in. So 
Uh, it's ensconced back there. It has a, a sound barrier on it because as you're pumping air, you get the, the pumping noise and the compressor's noise. So to help protect that, there's a little NVH countermeasure applied there. We did find one surprise when we uh, got to disassemble at this level. What's that? Well, it's not uncommon. We know you've got to send air back to each corner you know, to, to control that. But then there was another line that came out. So, well, what, is, what does that do? So it comes out and feeds around and find out that it attaches to the 800 volt battery pack and is actually charging, pressurizing that battery pack. Why would you do that? <laughs> that's the, the question. Everybody, there's a lot of cups of coffee around that. Is, wow, <laughs> what are we seeing? Why is it this way? And, you know, um, likely, since it's an off-road off capable vehicle, and you'll probably be doing some water fording and, you know, waiting. I'm sure there's requirements. You have to go through 30 inches of water, whatever it is. Well, you don't want water in your battery. No. And so if you look at these batteries, we take them apart, you'll see extensive sealing that, that goes in to hold these all together. And so since we're going to uh, subject it to water, you'd have to be awfully sure. Like there was a second motor for a failure mode here. This says, man, we can't let water in here. Especially if you're off-road, if you're really working the vehicle and generating a lot of heat as a result of, of all the work we're doing, you know, the batteries are starting to get hot. Now, if you submerse it underwater all of a sudden, because you're going, going to go play in the surf or some, something like that, boy, that temperature comes down, that pressure comes down, and, and you're underwater. And it says, oh, if I'm going to leak, this is when I'm going to do it. So by pressurizing that battery, it just says, no, if water's not coming in, if it's going to leak, air's going to leak out of wow. here. So that's uh, that that what it looks like clever. what we're doing. And, uh, you know, we'll, again, as we go and tear the battery down, uh, we'll be able to see more of that and understand mm -hmm. that. In fact, I'd love to have you guys come out when we get that battery oh, done shortly we, here. We, and we'd love yeah, to come back. We'd yeah, love to come back. This is uh, fascinating to go through these presentations. Yeah. And so, Terry, thanks again, man. John, my always pleasure. Learn. I always learn uh, a lot here, so thanks I, again. I do, too, and uh, our, our talk, you always inspire me to think even more. And uh, uh, the Cybertruck has got some things that are you know, revolutionary. There's other things they did just kind of because they could and wanted to, I think, in this thing. So it isn't a, a total you know, evolution or progression. Um, there isn't some, like the 48 volt and some of these things. You can just see where this thing's going and how it will lead to uh, manufacturing process changes and other things that is in their long-term vision. And other things are just cool. You know, they just wanted to do it because they could and did. And, uh, you know, the market will will bear whether or not that's pays off at the end, but real good. Best luck to them. We'll be back. Okay. Well, excellent, John. Glad to have you. Bye now.